Today we will be looking at the idea of a commitment to Christian witness, a commitment to Christian witness. If you'll remember, as we've been going over the past several weeks, what we have been looking at is a vision uh, for our church, where we are seeking to go, building uh, a framework, uh, a foundational framework for where we are going as a church, the things we will seek to hold to as believers, what we will seek to do with our lives, how we will follow God. And, And each week has built a complete picture. It's important that we remember that all of these things work together. The first couple sermons were over the foundational things and then what we build upon it. So it's important that we remember that these things are not individual things that you, you can pick and choose which ones you want to try to be good at or which ones you want to try to strive for, but all of them together are what the church and what we as believ- individual believers must do if we want to try to follow God with our lives. And so today we're coming to the idea of commitment to Christian witness. What does this mean? So the first uh, several structural elements were internal things, what we do together as a body of believers, how we operate among each other, how what the church does inside. And now we're looking at the external elements. What does the church do as as we leave on Sunday, as we leave and go to live in the world? How should we live? What should we do? So the first thing we see is commitment to Christian witness. This is the way that we live our lives. There's there's a quote, I think, that almost gets it right. A lot of people have used it. I've heard it before. I don't really like it. And it's it's misattributed to to St. Francis of Assisi. But it says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It almost gets there, but I don't like that quote. Because we see in, in Scripture, in Romans 10, 17, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. You can't preach the gospel without sharing the good news of what Jesus has done, right? So this idea that we can preach the gospel without words is is kind of is lacking. It's not when necessary use words. Let's change it and look at it this way. Preach the gospel at all times, even when you cannot use words. So this idea of commitment to Christian witness is, is your life, the way that you live, your actual everyday life, is it, commitment, is it consistent to what you say you believe about God? Your claim to be a Christian, your claim to follow God, your claim to follow him, is your life lining up with what Scripture calls us to be? So that's what we're going to get into. And to, to do that, we're going to turn to Titus chapter 3. But first, I want to give you a background on the book of Titus, a little bit of a background on the book of Titus. So Titus was in Crete, an island near Greece, and the people there were not the best people. So in Titus chapter 1.12, this is what Paul, who's writing this letter, says, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That does not sound like what I would want someone to say about me, Um, but it was well known in their world among their own people among those that weren't even there, that Cretans, people that lived in Crete, were liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, that they did not live a very moral life, that they were people that would try to take advantage of you, they were people that were difficult to be around. And that sets the stage for where they are, Uh, and it sets the stage for for the, the place where Paul is writing to and where Titus is seeking to do ministry. And with that, we'll get to our passage for today, starting in verse 1 of chapter 3 in Titus. Remind them then, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to always, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, Enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, So that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. 
These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law, because they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a divisive person after the first and second warning, for you know such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemned. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to look at his word this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word and what it contains and how we can see what you call us to do, how you, who you call us to be, how you call us to live by following you, by being obedient to your word. And Lord, I pray that today you would convict each and every one of us to be obedient to what your word calls us to be, to follow you, to lay aside what we want and our own desires and, and our own ideas that co- contradict scripture. Lord, I pray that we would lay those aside to simply seek to follow you and to be a good witness for you with our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first thing we see, which is really the essential part of what it means to have a Christian witness, is that we must live like Christians. We should live like people who follow Christ. And if we look at this passage, starting in verse 1, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. We should be model citizens of wherever we are. And this goes for Christians worldwide. Wherever you find yourself, wherever you find rulers and authorities, you should seek to be a model citizen. Now, I think this is at times very difficult to understand. And when we look at Scripture, it's important that we realize there is, a, there is not a direct path from Paul to us. Paul didn't write this letter to us. He wrote this to who? To Titus in Crete. Right? So what was he saying to Titus in Crete, and how does that apply to us? So the question we're seeking to answer is, is as we look at that first part, submitting to rulers and authorities and to obey, how does a Christian interact in the public square? As we look at what's going around, on in the world around us, how do we interact with it? Because I know, like many of you, I have concerns at times, the things I see happening in the world around us, right? There's reports of wars overseas. There's things that happen in our own country that are concerning to us. How do we interact with that? What should a Christian's response to those things be? So getting a better look at Crete. Polybius, a Roman historian, said this about Crete. Now, it would be impossible to find, except in some rare instances, personal conduct more treacherous or a public policy more unjust than in Crete. So what we see here is that even a historian that is not a Christian says these things about the people of Crete. And it's to this context that Paul says, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities and to obey. They are to be good citizens even in places that are difficult to be good citizens, where the rulers and authorities may not have a godly influence. We see a further explanation of this in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval." For it, is God, for it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does, who does wrong. Therefore you must submit, not only because of wrath, but beca- also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those who you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. It's very clear that the understanding of Scripture is that Christians should submit to rulers and authorities, but there is no expectation that these authorities will always be aligned with Christian witness or principles. However, in Scripture, we do see a clear exception to this when they ask you to deny Christ or to exalt Him over them. Right? Christians were killed by the Roman Empire for worshiping Christ. So at one point, these authorities told them, deny Christ. What did they do? They resisted. So this is the difficulty that we come into because we see a place 
where we're called to submit to authorities and submit to rulers, but at the same time we see a, a refusal to, to submit and to be faithful even to the point of death. And I think the difficulty that we come into is all of the realm in between, all of the area that's in between. I, I don't think most of us would disagree that, that the laws that we have in our land serve benefits, as this talked about, right? Don't steal, right? If you, if you steal, you're going to be punished by the, the law, by the government, and that is good. It actually lines up with God's word. But what about when there are things in society that begin to happen from the government, when things begin to happen that don't really make as much sense, when they're not something that's asking you to deny your faith, but they're not lined up with God's word either? See, it's easy when it's them asking you to deny your faith because we're called to be faithful to the point of death. We should reject authority when they call us to compromise our Christian values. So in this world we live in, how does this look? In a democratic republic where we have regular local, state, and national elections where our voices are heard, what does it look like to submit and obey? I think there's a few things we can think of as guiding principles for invol- involvement in public life. We should, be, we should be involved in what is happening in the world. We should be involved in what's happening in the world. When God's people in Israel governed themselves, he expected them to follow his law. And so when we have a voice and we're able to interact and play a role in the life around us, we should seek to make sure that, that the government is doing things that would be honoring to God as far as we are able. Right? That means you should vote. You should take consideration into what's happening in the world around you. You should support things that are biblical and not support things that are not biblical. But it also means we should submit to authorities and obey even when we don't agree with them. This does not mean you conform and compromise biblical values, but just because you don't like a person or all of their stances does not mean it's a, it's a reason that we can reject outright what's going on. We must be a good citizen. But more than anything, we should not lose our Christian witness because of what is happening politically. We don't see a call to rebel and to revolt in Scripture. This is a time where there was the Roman Empire. We don't see Paul advocating for them to try to do a regime change. But what do we see? Be faithful to Christ. This is our first and foremost thing we must do. The call is to make disciples, not to try to influence people through the public square. There are too many Christians who are more focused on what's happening in Washington, D.C. than they are focused on what's happening in the throne room of God. We cannot shift our focus from God and His mission and His glory to things that are happening in this world. That doesn't mean we don't care about them. Doesn't mean we don't engage with them. Doesn't mean we don't support things that are, are, are accurate and try to, to advance the kingdom of God in whatever way we can. But we have to keep the primary thing the primary thing. We have to focus on what God has called us to do. What is the mission that God has called us to? And if we focus on other things in such a way that we lose our ability to, to share the gospel with people, that's a problem. If we focus on what's happening in the world rather than on the one who has saved us, we have a problem. And this is important. This is so important because we must be examples of God to this world. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so the answer that we have to think about, what we have to consider is whether we must consider whether we are being good ambassadors for Christ or poor ambassadors. I know I may have shared this before. I think I've at least shared it on one occasion here. But growing up, you go on field trips and they say, you're an ambassador for this school. You represent this school. What you do represents the school that you're leaving. When you leave this place, when you go into your workplace, when you go into your families, where you go into traffic, into Walmart, wherever it may be that you're going, you are a representative of Christ. When you go to eat lunch after this today, you're a representative of Christ. 
You know how often I've heard that uh, a waiter or waitress's least favorite time to work is Sunday afternoon? Because of the church crowd. That is what it looks like to have a poor Christian witness. Because you leave worshiping and and, and celebrating our Savior to go and to berate a person. Right? James talks about that, taming the tongue. With, With our tongue, we both praise God who gave us life and at the same time curse men. These things shouldn't be so. We must have a commitment to Christian witness. So the question you need to ask is, if you are pleading on behalf of Christ, which we have to get to that too, which will be next, the next sermon that we have, evangelism and missions, but if we are pleading with others on behalf of Christ, is your life intriguing? When they look at your life, when they look at your life, do they, and you tell them about Christ, hey, Jesus saved me from my sins, he can save you too, does your life look any different than theirs? Does your life intrigue them to want to know more about who Christ is. What's so different about you? Why are you so different? Why do you act the way you act? That should be the question a non-Christian asks when they interact with you. We are to live up to the role of ambassador we've been given. And as we continue through this passage, to be ready for every good work, not some good works, every good work, every opportunity we have We should take it. To slander no one. Again, the way that we use our tongue, the way that we speak to others, the way we speak about others, is it honoring to God? To avoid fighting. One of the things that that we see in 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. When, When a soldier has a mission, when he has a task that he's been given, His job is to do it, right? To go and to to fulfill the orders that have been given. Not to stop and get get caught up in what's happening on the side of the road. Not to stop and get entangled in what he wants to do, but to fulfill the orders that he's been given. The question we have to ask, are we focused on the task we've been given? Or are there things that we're allowing to distract us? Things that are maybe important but less important that have taken us off of our main goal. To be kind. And this is simple. This is what we teach children all the time, right? Treat others the way that you would want to be treated. It's very easy to be kind to people, but our flesh constantly tempts us to to be selfish and, and to treat others in a way that's gratifying to us, but maybe harmful to them. Showing gentleness to all people. I want you to remember, too, who he is saying this to Titus about. He's saying this about the people in Crete, the people who are liars, evil beasts, lazy. To be gentle, to be kind to all of these people. Regardless of who they are, what they believe, we are called to be kind, gentle, and loving to people while speaking truth. I think a great way to test and to consider How you are doing in this is to look at the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Do you see these things in your life? Your everyday, regular life. Do you see the fruit of God's Spirit moving in your life? And the way you interact with others? This is what it means to be committed to Christian witness. Our lives resemble the life Christ calls us to live. When we share the gospel, it is already plainly visible and laid out in our lives. We don't have to, people shouldn't have to wonder, what would it look like if someone believed this? Because they should see it right in front of them. What would it mean for me to follow Christ? That question should not be what they have to ask, because they should see it right in front of them in the way that you live their life. Because, as we see later in this passage, we must remember our salvation. All right, so we got through the first couple passages, first two verses. That's all we've gotten through so far. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, not 
but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his life, his, his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. Everything that we've just talked about, everything that we've talked about, about how we should live out our faith in our life, how we should have fruit of the Spirit, how we should be concerned more with what God would have for us than what the world, what's happening in the world And how we engage with that. We should be more focused on our mission that God has given us rather than engaging all these other things. All of that hinges on what you have done with the gospel. Everything in scripture depends on the gospel because the gospel changes everything. This place where he he said this quote about them being liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons was true. But this is where he's saying that we once walked like this. We were once like that, for we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. He's telling Titus to remember what God saved him from. Remember who he would be if Christ had not intervened. Because the next thing was, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. That's the story of being a Christian, is that you were going the way of everyone else. Sinful. Lost. But the love of God appeared through Jesus Christ and what He did for you. And He saved you. So what's the message here? That as Titus is among these people and as he's interacting with these people, not only should he live differently than they live, to not live like they live, but Christ's love is for those people too. In this, we must remember that Christ died for all people. And the the answer to what may pop into your head is, yes, even that one. Even the people that we think may be the furthest from God, they they may have run from God, they may have heard the gospel and rejected, but Christ still died for that person. And this is where we must challenge our understanding of the gospel and to see whether we really believe it and put the, the rubber to the road of our belief of the gospel. Do you believe in the transforming power of the gospel? That he can take a person like the people described here in Crete, and turn them into someone that's following Christ. You don't have to look further than the very first verse of this book, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Because he was previously Saul, murderous ravager of the church. Because when the grace of God appeared to Saul, everything changed. When he encountered the love available through Christ and the forgiveness and the life-changing power of the gospel, everything changed. Do you believe in the transforming power of the gospel? Because we have to remember. We have to remember our sinfulness because we too once walked there. We have to remember the grace by which we have been saved. We have to remember that it is nothing that we did Nothing that it was from us, nothing that prompted God to do this for us, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, unmerited, undeserving favor given by God because of His love for us. And we see that the beauty that we are saved in an instant to be renewed for a lifetime So we see here the the phrasing, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, right? So when we talk about salvation, oftentimes what we will say is you are justified in an instant, right? When you accept Christ by faith, you make him your Lord and Savior, you are saved. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing that, that we, there's nothing lacking. Christ is sufficient for your salvation. And that's what this means here in regeneration. You are the washing of regeneration, 
You are formerly dead in your sins, raised to new life, regenerated by what Jesus has done, and then in renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is what we often talk about, sanctification, the lifelong process of being transformed and made to look more like Christ in our life. Saved and regenerated because of what Christ has done, renewed by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the understanding of what it means to be born again. That's a word, a phrase. I remember hearing that a lot more when I was younger. Right? I think, I think there was a, a phrase that Billy Graham used a lot about being born again. You must be born again. And I think that in, in the public life, there's kind of been a switch that's happened. I used to hear the, the reference of born again Christians. And that's kind of been replaced in a lot of public media with the word evangelical Christian. Right? If you hear about the evangelical Christians, that's, we would fall under that category. It's people that believe you must be saved, that you must be born again. I think that's a good belief because you know who said it? Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, he's talking to Nicodemus here, when Nicodemus came to him at night, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again, this is what happens when we understand our sinfulness and turn in faith to Christ. Paul explains this process in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. This is being born again. Without Christ in your life, you are dead in sin, dead in your trespasses. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, when we believe, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead. This is regeneration. This is being born again, saved by what Jesus has done. It's not about following rules or cleaning up your life. It's not about, it's about, it is about coming to Jesus for life because you are dead in your sin. This is something that each person individually has to do. Your parents can't do it for you. Your your spouse can't do it for you. Coming to church and attending and being faithful will not do it for you. It is only by the blood of Jesus that you can be saved. And then we are to be sanctified by the Spirit. The beautiful thing is that God gives us the power to live the life that God calls us to live. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. Isn't that wonderful? The beautiful thing about this is the spirit that God has abundantly given to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. If we will walk according to what the spirit guides us to do, walk in obedience to the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When we sin, we are gratifying the desires of the flesh and ignoring the spirit. That's the only two options. You walk in step with the spirit or you ignore the spirit and you you walk in the flesh. So if we want to have this Christian witness we're talking about, we must rely on the Spirit's power in our life to obey Him, to be obedient. And because of all of this, our future is sure, so that we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. No one can take what has been freely given to us by God. Because of what Jesus has done, we can know that we have eternal life that we have eternity that waits. And no one can take that from you. No one can take what God has given freely. And then we see this, this idea that this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed might be careful to vote themselves to good work. And this is why we have talked so much about the gospel today, because it's everything to this. We're talking about a commitment to Christian witness. Why should you have a commitment to Christian witness? Because of what Jesus has done for you. Not to save yourself, not to try to earn it, not to try to pay him back. But because of what he has done, because of how he's called us to live differently, we walk in a new way. And what I think is so beautiful about this passage, so beautiful about the way that he's phrased thing here, is there's a juxtaposition here in this scripture between what he says in chapter 1 and what he says here in chapter 3. Titus is only three chapters long. We're at the end of the book here. 
Again, we look at Titus 1.12. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. He says, this testimony about their sinfulness, this testimony about the way they're disobedient to God is true. What has been said is true about them. But in chapter 3, and I'm going to read it again, it's important. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not by the works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out His love on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs with the hope of of eternal life. And continuing on, this saying is trustworthy. This saying is trustworthy. So he says, hey, the things that they've said about them, this is true. This testimony, and it's the same word, it's logos. It's a different form of it, but logos. This word, this thing that's been said about them is true. And then he presents the gospel and he says, this saying is true. And what I see from that and what I think is so clear here is that no matter what may be true about someone, the power of God to save them is true, is more true than that. Wherever they may be, they can be saved. This is the gospel. Lost people saved and transformed by the power of God. And we are to live and interact with others as those who are saved by the power of God. And for this reason, and I don't think we need to ignore this part, for this reason we must discipline those who divide. This is what we see in this passage. Our primary focus is the gospel. And those who try to make it about something else are distracting from what our primary focus is. We see here, avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law because they are unprofitable and worthless. And then he goes further than that. We are called And I believe that we are called to discipline these people. He says here, reject a divisive divisive person after a first and second warning. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. So when, when someone is dividing and speaking and focusing on all these things that cause division and get people riled up that is not the gospel, Paul says here, warn them once, warn them twice. And then we're called to reject them. Why? Why do we do that? If we look elsewhere in Scripture, what is always the goal of discipline within the church? It's for reconciliation. It's not to punish. It's not to hurt them. It's not to make them feel bad about themselves. It is for the health of the body and for the health of that person. In 1 Corinthians, we see a picture of a a man that is living a life that is egregiously sinful, doing things that he said not even the pagans would approve of. And they've warned him, they've tried to correct him, but he still won't listen. He's proud about it. You know what Paul tells them? Reject him, have nothing to do with him. Do you know what we see in 2 Corinthians? Welcome him back. He understands what he has done. We can't allow things to happen within the church that are are focused on anything other than the gospel. When things become divisive, when things become issues, that is not what it should be about. And it's difficult to do this. It's difficult to look, about it, to look at how we should make those things play out within the church. But we see it in Scripture that we should hold each other to account for the health of the body, for the sake of the gospel. And this is true everywhere else in life. Everywhere else in life, if you are committed to something and you won't abide by what it should be, you, focus, you get off of track, you don't show up for work, there's going to be discipline involved. And in the church, we must make sure that the gospel remains the primary thing we're about. Because everything is about that. Everything is about what God has done for us. We should live our lives based upon what God has done for us and be committed to our Christian witness. So my question for you today, what does your witness look like? Are you a good example of a Christian in the way you live your life? 
When you leave this place, right? Casting Crowns had a, a, a wonderful album that was titled The Altar and the Door. Right? It's this idea that God help me not forget between the distance between the altar where you come to pray and to, to ask God to help you follow him more. Help me not forget between the altar and the door what you've done in my life. Help me not to go from this place and to live a life that's counter to what you've called me to live. Because when you share the gospel, you've already been presenting a case for what you're sharing. Are you a good example of a Christian in the way you live your life? The people you interact with each day, the people who observe you, how would they describe you? How would the people in your life describe you? Would it look like the fruits of the Spirit that we talked about earlier? Loving, joyful, gentle, or is it other things? How would people describe you? If you were to preach the gospel to someone, does your life confirm you believe it? Does your life confirm that you believe the gospel? And the most important question that you can answer is, have you trusted Christ? Have you been born again? This is not about trying to follow rules. This is not trying, about trying to come to church regularly. It's about submitting your life to Christ, saying, I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved. I need Christ to, to bring me to life because I'm dead in my sin. And submitting to, to him, to make him your Lord and your Savior. As Becky comes and we have a time of invitation, I want to challenge you. I'll be down front for prayer and, and we'll have this moment that we are able to, to worship God, to praise Him for what He's done, but also to reflect on ourselves. What in my life do I need to change for my life to be more consistent with who God calls me to be? And maybe this morning, what do I need to do to be more obedient to Him? Do you need to Follow up in baptism. Do you need to join the church? Do you need for the first time to surrender your life to Christ? To be raised to new life because of what Jesus has done. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time you've given us to come together. And Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts. I pray that you would work and that you would help us to see what it means to follow you. Help us to examine our lives and to see where our lives don't proclaim the gospel. Help us to be people that at all times, even when we can't use words, even when we're not speaking, are, are living so obedient to, to you that people can see your love and your, your grace and what you've done through the way we live our lives. And God, I pray that if there's any that, that need to follow you in obedience today, that they would be willing to do so. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand? Thank you.